There were a physicist, a circus strongman, and a statistician marooned on a desert island. A box of canned food washes ashore, and the question is, how to open the cans? The physicist suggests dropping them from trees so that they break open. The strongman says, no, that's too messy. Instead, he will rip the cans open with his hands. Well, the statistician still says that's still too messy, but he knows how to open the cans without making a mess. First, he says, assume we have a can opener. And sometimes in stats, we have to make assumptions. And we're going to go ahead and do conditions and calculate confidence intervals for proportions. So first of all, when constructing, a con when constructing a confidence interval for a proportion, we first need to determine what we're trying to estimate. Step one is state. State the parameter that you want to estimate. So in the example here uh, about a school budget, your local newspaper pulls a random sample of 330 voters, finding 144 who say they will vote yes on the upcoming school budget. Construct and interpret a 95% confidence interval for the proportion of voters who will vote yes. So first of all, we need to say, what are we looking for? The parameter. And in this case, they want us to construct a 95% confidence interval for P, the true proportion of all voters who will vote yes on the school budget. Step two is to plan. Okay, that means we're going to identify the appropriate inference method, and I'm about to teach you your very first one, and we're going to check conditions. And there could be some assumptions, like in our joke. When we sampled the beads in our class activity, we used our histogram to estimate an appropriate interval. Now we want to know what the sampling distribution lo looks like without having to take a lot of samples. So we're just taking the estimate from one sample, or which in this case will be proportions, and we're going to approximate it with a normal distribution given that the following three conditions are met. When using a normal approximation for proportions, we use a one sample z interval for p, the proportion. All right. On your calculator, that's called the one prop z int, and your calculator notes will show you how to calculate that. So which conditions do we need to check? There's a random condition that the data comes from a random sample, or if we're told that it's representative, that's actually good enough because the whole point of randomizing is to get a representative sample. 10% condition. If we're sampling without replacement, which is most of the time, then the sample size uh, needs to be less than 10% of the population. So you can verify that your sample size is less than 10% or state, kind of make an assumption, that the population must be more than 10 times the sample size. We also have the large counts condition, uh, where NP must be greater than 10, which is your expected number of successes, and your expected number of failures must also be greater than or equal to 10. Show your calculations, or you won't get credit for checking the conditions. Writing conditions with a check mark does not count as checking conditions. So let's go ahead and look at part two for our school budget example. What's our plan? Well, if the conditions are satisfied, we will use the normal model to find a one sample Z interval for P, the proportion. What are the conditions again? The random. It is given that the sample of voters is random, so that condition is satisfied. 10% condition. Provided that there are more than 3,300 eligible voters, 330 is less than 10% of the population of voters. So we're kind of assuming that one. Large counts we can calculate. Uh, probability of success is 144 because our sample had 144 who would say yes. Failure is the balance, which is 186. Both of those are greater than or equal to 10, so our large counts condition is satisfied. So now we're going to teach you how to calculate the interval. Step three we like to call do, which is perform the calculations. So we're going to use the inverse norm function that you learned quite a long time ago, and it does default to areas to the left. Now if you have the newer calculators that I have, 
This is way easier. I don't have to do this piece anymore. I can just say, oh, I want 0.95 in the center, and it will give me my critical value. But let's assume that you have an older calculator. You basically need to find the area to the left right there. So you're going to go 1 minus your confidence level divided by 2. Note this is not on your math chart. If we are using the most popular confidence level, 95%, then we would use inverse norm of 1 minus 0.95, because we would have 95% in here. There's 5% left over for both sides. We divide it by 2, which is basically 2.5%. And we get 1.96. By the way, we use that number all of the time, so it is worth memorizing. And uh, if we had used, by the way, if we had used inverse norm of 0.95 or even 0.05, we would not get the correct critical value. So make sure if you're using the modern calculators and you put 0.95 in the center, you're great. If you're trying to use the left area, you have to compensate that the leftover areas uh, split between the left and the right. So let's calculate the critical value for a 90% confidence level. This is, again, assuming you don't have the easy calculator. We're going to do inverse norm of 1 minus 0.9. Where did we get 0.9 from? It's 90%. We divide it by 2 because that's the leftover is 10%, and we're going to have 10% on the left and the right, which gives us 10% uh, split among the left and the right, which means we have 5% on the left and 5% on the right. And our critical value is 1.645. As the confidence level increases, the width of the confidence interval also increases. So the more confident you want to be, the bigger a net you cast. Once we determine a critical value, then we multiply it by the standard deviation to figure out how far we need to go in each direction for our interval. This distance is called the margin of error. So it's just your z star, your critical value, times your standard deviation. To get the lowest value for the confidence interval, we subtract the margin of error from our value. And to get the highest one, we add it. And your formula chart shows this for the confidence interval. Statistics plus or minus critical value times the standard deviation of the statistic. Recall that our goal is to make an estimation of the proportion, the parameter, and we're going to base that on our sample. So we're going to use p hat, which is our statistic from our sample. We also don't know p, which is what we're trying to estimate it with p hat. And um, when we're estimating the standard deviation, because we're basing it on the sample, we don't really like to call it standard deviation anymore. We like to call it standard error. Uh, and the formula in the chart for standard deviation is nearly identical to that for standard error. Basically, it's your p hat times 1 minus p divided by n. Take the square root. So let's revisit the school budget example, and we're going to start doing the calculations. First of all, there are the formulas from the formula chart. Let's calculate p hat. We had 144 say yes out of a total of 330, or 0.436. Now we're going to calculate our standard error. So I'm going to substitute in the 0.436 in. And 1 minus that is 0.564 divided by 330. Take the square root. And I've got about 0 0.027. So my margin of error is going to be the critical value, all right, and we're doing a 95% confidence interval, times this value, the standard error. So it's going to be 1.96, which we said, hey, that's the critical value most of the time for 95% confidence, times this value, which gives us 0 0.053. So the confidence interval is 0.436 plus or minus 0 0.053. So if I subtract the 0 0.053, I get 0 0.383 on the bottom. If I add it, I get 0 0.489 on the top. So my interval is from 0 0.383 to 0.489. Now, how do you interpret it? Uh, here's the boilerplate. We are blank percent confidence that the interval blank to blank captures whatever the heck we're trying to capture. So for our school budget example, we are 95% confident, because that's what we used, that the interval from 0.383 to 0.489 captures P 
equals the true proportion of all voters who will vote yes on the school budget. Let's go ahead and do another example where I give you a confidence interval. So a survey was done of students who speak a, sang a second language. Based on the results, they calculated the interval as 0.05 to 0 uh, 0.18 with a 95% confidence level. What is the point estimate for the proportion of students who speak a second language? For us right now in this class, uh, we just take the midpoint of our confidence interval. All right, so it's the average of the two endpoints. And we get 0.115 or 11.5% is our point estimate. What's our margin of error? It's the distance from that point to either end of the interval. So I could take the high end um, minus the, I'm sorry, the midpoint minus the low end, and I get 0.065. Or I could take the high value minus the midpoint, and I get 0.065. So the margin of error here is 0 0.065. Now the teacher thought 20% of the students spoke another language. What do you conclude? Is 20% or 0 0.20 in our interval? It's not. Because 0 0.20 is outside of the confidence interval, there is sufficient evidence that the proportion of students who speak a second language is not 20%. So we can also use these to determine the number of people we need to poll or sample. Um, generally, I work with this formula setup, which you can get from the formula chart and solve for n. So I'm just going to use the actual formula from the for formula chart. But if you rearrange it, you can get it so that n equals z squared times p times 1 minus p over margin of error squared. My examples are going to use this because that's on your formula chart when you're taking your AP test. If you feel like memorizing that, you have my blessing. But if you forget it and you don't know how to get from here, you may be up a creek. Now let's look at another example for a new medication. An experiment finds that 27% of 53 subjects report improvement after using a new medicine. Create a 95% confidence interval for the actual cure rate. Why is this interval so wide? So we're going to start with the first step, which is state. And that is 95, we're trying to find a 95% confidence interval for P, which is the true proportion of subjects that improve after using a new medicine. And now we check the conditions and determine our plan. So what kind of interval will we use? A one sample Z interval, which means we use a normal model provided that the conditions are satisfied. What are the conditions? Random condition. Well, hopefully, if it's an experiment worth its salt, and it included random assignment of volunteers to treatment groups. So we're going to assume that. 10% uh, condition. We're not too worried about replacement because we can replace the medication by making more. And we are testing the medication, not the subject. So we're going to say that one's satisfied. Large counts, the number of successes we expect is 14, which we got by multiplying n and p hat. And failure is the balance of that, which is 39. So we're going to say those two, that is also satisfied. Now let's go ahead and do the calculations. So from the formula chart, we have the mean is the proportion and the standard deviation. We need to calculate that. So our, our proportion mean is 0.27. Our sample size is 53. We'll go ahead and substitute in the 0.27 and the 53, and we get a standard error of 0 0.061. So for the margin of error, that's your critical value times your standard error. Well, if we want 95% confidence, that's 1.96. Memorize that. And we already calculated standard error at 0 0.061, so we get 0.12 as our margin of error. So we can say the confidence interval is 0.27, the proportion we got, plus or minus 0.12. Or if you want to actually go ahead and subtract and add, it starts at 0.15 and goes up to 0.39. So why is the interval so wide? Well, a sample size of 53 people doesn't provide a great deal of accuracy in our estimate, and I should really say precision. The standard error is still quite large. And since we're using a 95% confidence interval, a uh, confidence level, our interval is wider. So 
Let's go ahead and try to make it narrower by using a 90% confidence and let's find out what we get. So standard error is the same, p hat is still the same, but now my critical value is 1.645. So calculating my margin of error, I get 0.10, uh, 0 0.10, which is a little bit smaller and I get 0.17 to 0.37. So by making a slightly less confident level, we can tighten up the interval. So it does have the advantage of being tighter, more precise, but we're less confident in our ability to capture the true proportion with our, in, within our interval. Now let's say we wanted to create um, a confidence interval with a margin of error plus or minus 0.1 and say I'm 99% confident. So believe it or not, you can design your studies to get roughly the desired level of confidence. Well, we already know that p hat is 0.27. So we're going to use z equals 2.58 for 99% confidence. How did I get that? You could do the inverse norm of the like 0.005, that half a percent that's left on the left side. Or you can use your calculator and put in 0.99 for the center area and you'll get pretty much 2.58 for your critical value. So that works well if you're using the more modern calculators where they let you uh, put in the center area. So I'm going to go back to the margin of error formula, but instead of knowing what my standard error is, now I know what my margin of error is. So my substitution looks a little different. And then I can figure out standard error is supposed to be 0 0.0388. Well, standard error, I also have a formula for it. It's the p or p hat times 1 minus p hat over n. Square both sides and then solve for n. And I get about 130.9. Always round up even if they had 0.1 there. And so I need about 131 subjects to get the confidence interval I need. So what sample size would we need in a follow-up study if you wanted a margin of error of 5% with 98% confidence? So again, p hat's the same and I'm trying to find 98% confidence that's going to affect my critical value. And uh, basically, so I'm going to have 98% in the center, center I have 2% left over, one for each side. So I can just do inverse norm of that 1% or 0.01. And I get a Z value of negative 2.326. Go ahead and use the positive. And we'll substitute and find our standard error, which is 0 0.0215. Now I'm going to go to the standard error formula. Remember, I already know P hat and 1 minus P hat. And solve it for N. First, square both sides and then cross multiply if you need to, rearrange, and I get about 426.39. So I need 427 people if I want plus or minus 5% with 98% confidence. Now this assumes that I already know what percentage I'm going to get from my sample, but sometimes I don't know. So how could we know the sample size we should try before we ever take our first sample? Well, remember that the sample size using the shortcut formula is your critical value squared, and that depends on confidence level, uh, times your p hat times 1 minus p divided by your desi um, desired margin of error squared. So this is determined by confidence level. This is kind of how tight you want it to be. So your variable here is p hat. What's that going to be? Q hat, by the way, is one way of writing um, 1 minus p hat. Well, I'm going to take that product, and the worst case scenario, this product will be the biggest that it could be. Where does that happen? Well, um, it's going to happen right there, okay? And so the worst case scenario is that p hat is 0.5. So we're going to use 0.5 to determine how big a sample size we need. So if you don't know the proportion, assume it's 0.5 and that'll give you a safe sample size. So if I want a sample size for 3% margin of error with a confidence level of 95%, how big a sample should I take? 
Well, I don't know what p hat is. I don't even have context for this question, but I could still guess sample size. So we're going to assume p hat is 0.5 since it ma maximizes the product of p hat and q hat, and it'll provide the largest estimate of standard error. We're going to use z equals 1.96 because we do know our confidence level is 95%. And then we'll go ahead and use the formula. So I want plus or minus 0.03. I substitute that in for the margin of error. There's a 1.96, and we're going to solve for that. I get 0 0.0153. Now let me take that other standard error formula, and I'm going to put in that 0.5 again, square both sides, solve for n, and I get about 1,067.97. Uh, or basically about 1,068. So we'll do what polling organizations usually do and choose the more, most cautious proportion, 50%. You need at least 1,068 likely voters if that's the problem we're doing.